Hello again, and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast as we continue our hematology series. I'm Rahul Gosain, here with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain, and today we're tackling myelofibrosis, where we've seen some exciting updates in symptom management and emerging treatment combinations, but there's still a lot to be done for this disease. As a community oncologist, we often get referrals for cytopenias or splenomegaly, and knowing how to diagnose risk stratify, and treatment in a timely manner is crucial here. MF can also present as primary or secondary, evolving from other MPNs like PV or ET, and it sometimes can also overlap with MDS. To guide us through the 2025 treatment landscape for myelofibrosis, we're excited to have Dr. Rajat Rampal, an expert in MPNs from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Rajat, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. Welcome, Rajat. Uh, the space of myelofibrosis has evolved quite a bit, where we now have multiple JAK inhibitors available to help from symptomatic management. However, the only curative modality still remains transplant, which is mainly reserved for high-risk patients and that handful intermediate-risk patients as well. Rajat, can you start us off with the initial workup and diagnostic criteria when you're seeing anyone with suspected myelofibrosis, where they will be presenting with cytopenias and one has ruled out secondary etiologies like infectious, inflammatory, nutritional deficiencies like folate, B12, copper, and zinc? Yeah, absolutely. The key things initially are getting the bone marrow. We cannot make the diagnosis without a bone marrow examination. But hand in hand with that is the next generation sequencing. A broad panel makes the most sense because, of course, there's three driver mutations. There's JAK2, there's MIPL, and there's calreticulin. But I also think beyond that, there is a lot of prognostic information to be gleaned from other mutations. Many of the panels used commercially nowadays are very broad, the myeloid panels that are used. So one of those, I think, is essential in both making the diagnosis, but, you know, subsequently looking at some of the prognostic factors informed by the genomics. Aside from that, I think it's important to get a spleen examination radiographically. Now, obviously, we can do this clinically, but I think it is important to get a radiologic exam, particularly getting a spleen volume, not just the length. I don't think the length is actually that informative. I think it's the volume that's more informative. And again, that helps make the diagnosis, but it also gives you data in terms of your starting point, right? And that is something that can and perhaps should be done in a serial fashion going forward, but we can get into that. Other things, of course, reviewing the peripheral blood smear. We usually see a leukoerythroblastic blood film in these patients, and also getting the LDH. The LDH is part of the minor diagnostic criterion, but also is an informative thing to watch over time. Roger. So you got that initial workup, be it your bone marrow biopsy, imaging, molecular testing. Are you doing molecular testing only on your bone marrow biopsy? Can this be done on peripheral blood? Depending on the driver mutation, their outcomes are different. Also, then we start to put them in these different buckets. Then how are you risk stratifying? Yeah, so, you know, peripheral blood molecular testing is absolutely reasonable. At least, you know, there doesn't seem to be any major discrepancies between what you see in the bone marrow and the blood with regards to mutations. Many of these patients are peripheral, and oftentimes what you're getting is peripheral blood when you're doing the aspirate. So peripheral blood molecular testing, absolutely fine. In terms of stratification, right, we, we can use the IPSS, International Prognostic Scoring System, or the DIPSS, the dynamic. The dynamic can be used at any time in the patient's course. The risk factors include things like leukocytosis with a white count over 25, you know, age over 65, the presence of constitutional symptoms, anemia, which really seems to be a major driver of prognosis. There is a molecularly inspired scoring system that is really for primary myelofibrosis, not really validated in secondary myelofibrosis. And that in, in encompasses the use of a couple of different mutations that seem to be associated with a higher risk of disease progression. And those are IDH1 and 2 mutations, EZH2 mutations, ASXL1 mutations, and SRSF2 mutations. I will say there is very recent data that challenges that paradigm and perhaps the actual mutations that matter will be revised in the near future. Nonetheless, that is informative stuff. There are other things that I think are important. 
getting the cytogenetics from the bone marrow, I think, is very important. It doesn't always happen, but there are cytogenetic changes that do portend a worsen prognosis, and that can be incorporated into some of the scoring systems as well. Thanks, Roger. Now, you made the diagnosis and risk stratified these patients as well, where very low risk or asymptomatic ones can rather be monitored or be part of a clinical trial, but close surveillance is certainly what's needed. But Roger, how about those symptomatic patients or someone who has anemia, thrombocytopenia, or splenomegaly? How are you deciding on your first line treatment options when you have multiple available here? And this is outside a clinical trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the ruxolitinib has really been the drug we've used most, and it's our oldest available drug. I think it is an excellent drug for symptom management. It's an excellent drug to reduce the size of the spleen, but it is a drug that is dosed based on the platelet count. That is sometimes where we have to be very judicious because lower doses of ruxolitinib, typically below 10 milligrams twice daily, really aren't getting great spleen or symptom effect. And so using attenuated ruxolitinib which is what we had to do before we had other drugs, is really suboptimal. We have a patient who's symptomatic who's got a big spleen. This is a JAK inhibitor eligible patient. In somebody who's got preserved counts, rexalitinib, I think, is an excellent choice. Hydratinib has also been studied and absolutely can be used in this setting. Granted, it does have a black box warning for Wernicke encephalopathy, and it does have much more in the way of gastrointestinal side effects, but it, it is a good drug to accomplish spleen reduction in particular. Critinib is a really interesting drug, and that's a drug we use when patients have a platelet count under 50 in the treatment-naive setting, because you can use the full dose of the drug, whereas ruxolitinib is labeled for platelets of 50,000 and higher. When the patients are in that peri-50,000 range, starting platelets of 58 or 60,000 or below, Picritinib is a really good choice because you don't have to attenuate the dose of the drug. You can use full intensity dosing, whereas you can't with ruxolitinib. Finally, there's mamalotinib, the newest kit on the block. Mamalotinib is approved for patients with myelofibrosis and anemia. Anemia is a subjective thing, right? Because you have patients who have a hemoglobin of nine and they're running marathons and you have your COPD, CAD patient with a hemoglobin of nine who needs the red blood cell transfusion. So I don't think there's a real number that is a, a cutoff for when you could consider mamalotinib. I think it's very patient specific. But the benefit of mamalotinib, at least as compared to ruxolitinib, is that the proportion of patients who can remain red cell transfusion independent is higher with mamalotinib versus ruxolitinib. We do see a decrease in the red count in all patients treated with ruxolitinib in the first three months, but it usually does improve over time. But the patients who continue to have red cell transfusion dependency or symptomatic anemia after three months, you actually have a worse prognosis. Using a drug like mamalotinib, better free the patient of transfusion dependency while addressing the spleen is a very good use of mamalotinib. Oh, well, while we are talking about the JAK inhibitors, I just want to reiterate something that has been brought up in our prior podcast with Dr. Pemaraju and going over myelofibrosis treatment algorithm, that you do not need JAK mutation for any of the JAK inhibitors to work. So one can utilize in any of those settings, but does not have to check for JAK mutation. Absolutely correct. Okay. Calreticulin and nipple mutant patients will still respond. Absolutely, for sure. And again, JAK2 inhibitors, for the most part, remain backbone throughout the treatment course here, and we'll keep bringing that up. Roger, you briefly touched on the side effect of fedratinib being encephalopathy. What about ruxolatinib, mamalatinib? What are some of the side effects that we need to keep in mind when we're using these drugs? For ruxolitinib, a couple of things. One is that there is an increased risk of zoster. So we usually make sure that patients have had their shingles vaccination before we start therapy. The second is there is an increased risk of squamous cell cancer of the skin. So in practice now, I have patients see dermatology once a year. And there have been opportunistic infections aside from zoster. We've occasionally seen reactivation of tuberculosis. So our practice, we usually get a quantifiron test if that's applicable prior to starting as well. And we've uncovered a couple of cases of latent TB that way, surprisingly. Mamalotinib, we've seen peripheral neuropathy in the earlier trials of the drug, and that's also been my clinical experience. Not very frequent, but it does happen. That's been the major thing. Very occasionally, GI side effects. We do see GI side effects typically in the first couple of weeks. A lot of nausea, some diarrhea. Usually that goes away after four to six weeks of therapy. Early intervention pays dividends, right? So at the first sign of diarrhea, starting people on antidiarrheals and antiemetics usually will work well. One common side effect, which 
it ends up being a class effect ends up being fatigued with all of them. And on our end, that when we're trying to decipher, is it from the treatment or underlying disease? That is also important. And the timeline for that plays a big role. Yeah. And uh, fatigue is one of these symptoms. It's very difficult to figure out what is the attribution, right? We always tell the patients it's always all of the above. I think in many cases, people do feel better with some of the drugs, particularly with ruxolitinib. I, I think we see a better symptom burden control and so sometimes that fatigue will get better. But is it from the disease itself? Is it from becoming anemic because of the treatment? Right. Those are the hard things to figure out. Right. Tying in some of the supportive care management that we are discussing here, when one is presenting with anemia, we shouldn't forget about the erythropoietin stimulating agents. Raja, do you check EPO level here prior to administering any of these agents if one is transfusion dependent? Yeah, we always check EPO. And it's sort of like with MDS, if the EPO level is under 500, it's probably reasonable to try, particularly if it's under 250 or 200. You know, from an off-label perspective, loose powder sept is obviously FDA approved for MDS. It has been studied with ruxolitinib in myelofibrosis in a phase two trial. It does not have approval for this, but we do use that as an off-label modality as well. And which is the right patient for loose powder sept in this setting for myelofibrosis, particularly from anemia? Typically, if a patient has not responded or is not a candidate for, for an ESA, then we'll, we'll try loose powder sept. We usually tend towards trying the ESA first. All right. So often Jack inhibitor is in supportive care, but Rajat, we see this day in, day out. In our clinic, majority of these patients will run into disease progression. Then do you circle through your other Jack inhibitors? What is the efficacy of our available options here if the disease has progressed on Jack inhibitor upfront? Yeah, I think this is a case where a clinical trial should be the next move, right? Because we have so Absolutely. many trials ongoing where you right. can add on agents to Jack inhibitors, and we've seen some really nice efficacy with these newer agents in development. To me, that's usually, again, this is referral center bias, right? I think that if possible, referring for patients to trials should be priority one. Now, Absolutely. if that's not you know, possible or a patient is not a, a candidate for whatever reason, can you circle through Jack inhibitors? The answer is yes. There is data you know, to switch from, for example, Rux to Fedratinib, Rux to Mamalotinib, Rux to Picritinib. But I think the most robust data is with Fedratinib. There's about a 30% response rate in terms of spleen volume and symptoms by clinical trial criteria. If you look at the data, the majority of patients have some benefit. One old trick is to slowly taper off the JAK inhibitor and then reintroduce it. Because of the way resistance occurs, it is actually dependent on exposure to the JAK inhibitor. So that is an old school trick from the days before we had other JAK inhibitors that can be used, but obviously you have to be very judicious in tapering the JAK inhibitor because of the SERS effect you can see if you take it off too quickly. And again, we touched briefly on fedratinib encephalopathy. When we're using this, we have to monitor thymine and replace that so that we don't run into that issue. Rajat, any role of spleen radiation to control spleen amygdala in these settings? That is a palliative measure largely, mm -hmm. right? Because usually once you've done radiation, you don't have a surgical option any yep. longer. In patients who are really refractory to therapy, it can be useful. The problem is that in some patients, most of their hematopoiesis is actually coming from the spleen and not the bone marrow. So we've seen this in the past when we used to do splenectomies, where sometimes you take the spleen out and the counts just never recover because that was the source of hematopoiesis. And there's no way to know that. So in somebody who just has large splenomegaly, I wouldn't be inclined to do it. Somebody who is really symptomatic for which there is no other, we've tried multiple other treatment options. I think it is a reasonable thing to try. Majority of our conversation here is outside of transplant being in question, but I just want to reiterate that transplant is the only curative option here, and partnering up with tertiary or quaternary centers should be the way to go. Coming back to the clinical setting, we have touched on anemia, but other complications that we tend to encounter is thrombocytopenia. Mm. We have the approval of pecritinib, but also, Rajat, any role of TPO mimetics here or Agnes, can you please touch your treatment algorithm, how you treat these patients? Generally, no, because the problem is you do get stimulation of megakaryocytes, and that is what we think drives the disease, particularly in the spleen. So we've been very reluctant to use it. This is highly problematic. You do not right. have a lot of options. Sometimes right. it's due to hyperspleenism. We have seen with an old drug, thalidomide, some nice results. We did a, you know, a couple of years ago, phase two study combining thalidomide with ruxolitinib. And in fact, all of the patients who had thrombocytopenia, platelets had to be at least 50 
80,000 or higher in the study, they all shed a nice improvement in their platelet count. So that is sort of digging into the archives, but you can safely combine it with ruxolitinib. And in some of those patients, you will see a very nice spleen response, or yeah, a platelet response. Yeah, but again, this ends up being a common but a tough problem when you're running into thrombocytopenia because you have very limited options. Rajat, before we start to close, we started off with focusing on primary myelofibrosis, where our treatment paradigm, again, we have these four jack inhibitors. For secondary myelofibrosis, if transplant is not an option, what about their outcomes? Is the treatment all that different really from primary myelofibrosis? Not really. I think we very much approach it the same way. Generally speaking, if you look at the data, it does seem that they have a more prolonged course versus those patients with primary myelofibrosis, right? So yeah, it, not, we don't think about these things too differently. But you know, maybe going back to the point that Rohit made about the transplant, I 100% agree. I actually think early referral is the right thing to do for patients with yes. intermediate or higher risk disease you know, to start the donor search. One of the problems we run into with a transplant is the, the best time to take the patient to transplant is when they're clinically doing well. It is hard to convince somebody who's been feeling terrible and now feels great on their JAK inhibitor that we should move towards the transplant when they're feeling well, right? You know, we, obviously we don't want to send people when they're very sick. So I think earlier referral and starting that conversation is absolutely key. Before we close, any final thoughts for community oncologists treating myelofibrosis here in 2025, tying in with quaternary tertiary centers is certainly the key, but outside of that, any important things to mention here? Yeah, I think there is such an abundance of clinical trial options these days, and we sometimes joke there's more trials than there are patients with myelofibrosis. What we've found to be very effective is partnering with our community oncology colleagues. It's common that we'll get a referral for a newly diagnosed patient. We'll talk about potential trial options here, but in many cases, we you know decide that standard management with JAK inhibitor is right. We send the patient back to the community oncologist, and we see the patient perhaps once a year as new trial concepts come forward. Many of which are now targeted towards the driver mutation of the disease, making sure that the patient is plugged in with the trial options if they are reasonable and feasible while partnering with our community colleagues is essential. You know, from transplant to clinical trials to our available treatment options, we've covered a lot here. Rajit, thank you. For our listeners, let's go over a quick recap from today's discussion. In today's talk with Dr. Rajit Rampal, we focus on the current treatment landscape for myelofibrosis. Upfront workup includes marrow and NGS and risk stratification to decide how aggressively to treat is going to be crucial. We now have four JAK inhibitors, ruxolotinib, mamelotinib, fidratinib, and pacritinib. Besides these agents, supportive care around anemia, thrombocytopenia, and importantly, managing patient symptoms is what we focused on. It's important to reiterate two things. First, JAK inhibitors play a role regardless of underlying JAK mutation or not. And secondly, stem cell transplant is the only curative treatment option right now in 2025. Partnering up with tertiary and quaternary centers should be the way to go. Thanks for tuning in. Check out our other hematology episodes. We are the Oncology Brothers.